Oh, all you smart listeners are going to love this podcast. By the way, it's all of you. Anybody who watches this is really smart, so I know you're all going to enjoy this. We talk to Zach Abbott, the founder of ZBiotics, and talk all about bacteria science, how it affects performance, digestion, moods, and then it gets really crazy. We talk about the world of genetically modified bacteria, which I'm telling you right now, the future of this is revolutionary. Anyway, here's the giveaway. I know that's why you're here right now. You want free stuff. That's fine. Here you go. MAPS Powerlift is today's giveaway program. It's a powerlifting-specific workout program. So if you want to get your bench press, your deadlift, and your squat up, this is the program to follow. Here is how you win. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Got to do all those things. If we pick your comment, and we will notify you, and then you'll win MAPS Powerlift for free. Also, we got a sale going on this month. Maps Anywhere, 50% off, and the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes Maps Anywhere, Maps Anabolic, Maps Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, is also 50% off. So if you want to sign up for any of those and use a discount code, here's what you got to do. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code NOVEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Zach, I'd like to start out just by just... Let's just talk about what the microbiome is. I want to get into the science of the microbiome and how these bacteria affect our behaviors and performance and digestion and all that stuff. But before we do, let's to kind of explain what it is first off. Yeah. So the microbiome, basically, I mean, there's kind of a lot of – there's a little bit of argument still in kind of the microbiology community about what the microbiome actually is. But generally speaking, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's just all the microbes that are living in your gut as well as kind of all the – the DNA and and proteins and functions that are related to those microbes. So there's sort of this like metabolic network or like net of of interactions that all those microbiome, uh, all those microbes are are kind of enacting. And so all of that kind of sphere of influence around those microbes is also considered the microbiome. So all the like small molecules they produce and and all the things that they eat and and uh, and all of that is all kind of part of the microbiome yeah. as well. So w w you brought up there's like a you know there's some debate. What's the debate? Where is there where is the divide at with well, this? Well, some people say that like microbiota is the is the proper name for like the the bacteria or like the small like, you know microbes in the gut and then the microbiome is like is the DNA only and like the genes that are present. And so, you know, there's all these like, you know, it's all linguistics, yeah. but like generally Nerd, speaking, nerds fighting over who's smarter. Exactly. About <laughs> <laughs> Literally that. Typically. Well, actually, I think that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, but really, I mean, when people say the microbiome, the common meaning is really just like everything that's happening in the gut, like due to the microbes themselves. Mm. Yeah. Now, and this is relatively new science. Uh, I mean, I've been in fitness long enough to remember when nobody talked about this at all. Yep. I mean, for, for decades, we were prescribing antibiotics um, just willy-nilly, not really considering its potential impact on our internal or external microbiome. And now it, it's like I almost don't go a day without reading an article about how the microbiome has been tied to. I mean, recently I read something about how it was tied to um, depression, mm. um, anxiety, happiness. Like how would how in the hell would this all work? Yeah. How why does it have such a strong influence on us? Totally. Well, I mean, like first, I think it it helps to kind of give like a, a explanation of the scale we're talking about, right? So we have roughly in our gut a roughly the same number of bacterial cells as you do human cells in your whole body, right? Okay. So it's like one to one, um, and so that's a lot. But obviously, microbial cells are smaller. But what's interesting is that. The, all of the cells in our body have the same set of DNA, right? So we have the same genes, and they're expressed differently in different parts of our body, but, like, it's the same genes, right? Um, but all those microbes in your gut have different genes and different DNA. So they actually have um, – oh, shoot, I forgot the number. Now I should know this. But it's something like 30,000 more genes than human genes that are in your gut. So that's 30,000 more biological functions, like the variety of biological wow. functions is happening in the gut as opposed to our uh, – the rest of our body, right? And so you can imagine that also there's never been a time that human humans have lived without those microbes in their gut. So our evolution has absolutely been evolved, uh, has been influenced by all those microbes, right? And so like we think about like you're talking about mood, you talk about like you know neurotransmitters are those small molecules, right? That your brain uses for like for really you know translating emotions and thoughts. Um, what's crazy is that like the exact same like biosynthetic pathway, the exact same genes that are that we use to make some of those neurotransmitters are found in bacteria. 
um, and they actually think that we actually stole them from bacteria. So like mm -hmm. some of the way we think is actually from bacteria. That's how central they are to how we function. And so all this stuff that's happening in our gut is really like, I mean, Who's who's like right? Are we human or are we yeah. bacteria? Are we actually bacteria? Or yeah. Are we just a human shell? Right, you know, housing exactly. bacteria? Are they just walking us around? Yeah. You know? <laughs> is it, now, is it fair to say, from what I know about evolution, bacteria was here before humans? Oh, so, yeah. So is it? It's safe to say not only do we co-evolve. But uh, they were here first, so it's mm -hmm. almost like bacteria have human cells, not the other way around. I mean, dude, that's a great right. way to put it. I mean, you know, bacteria were around for three billion years, and you know, humans have been around for like 150 million or something along those lines. And so, you know, it's obviously a whole level of magnitude longer. Um, and so, all the animals that evolved before humans were also evolving with bacteria. And so, right, bacteria have like deeply influenced the, our biology, and they continue to be a really central and integral part of how we operate. Like, I'll give you a really cool example. Uh, it's a really common one in the field of microbiology. It's one of these kind of like um, like really clear stories of, of how important a microbiome is. So um, they did this experiment in mice. They take two mice that are genetically identical. So in every way, they're absolutely identical, they're identical twins. twins, right? And uh, the only difference is that one of those one of those mice has a, a normal microbiome, and then the other mice the other mouse does not. It's called a germ-free mouse, and it's very hard to create a germ-free mouse, but they do them, and then and they have these these mice have no bacteria in their gut. And first and foremost, those two genetically identical mice are completely different. The, the, the mouse with no microbiome is dumber. It can't solve mazes as fast. It's like, uh, it doesn't, uh, it has a weaker immune system. It like, uh, doesn't absorb its nutrients from its food as efficiently, all these things. Right. And so, um, some of those you expect some, you wouldn't, what's crazy is that if you then take, um, an obese mouse and transfer its microbiome into that germ free mouse that germ-free mouse will become obese. And so it's not just because it's absorbing nutrients more efficiently from its food, it actually starts eating more. Um, so, so I just wanna like really let that sink in. If you think about like how amazing that is, that like just by putting bacteria in your gut, now the mouse is making different decisions. It's deciding to eat more, right? So when you think yeah. about like it's 11 o'clock at night and you know rationally that you don't need any more food, but you're like, you go into the kitchen and get a snack anyway, Who's making that decision? Are you making that decision? <laughs> or is the microbes in your gut, are they telling you to do that? Yeah, you know what's funny is uh, we literally recorded a podcast <clears> earlier <throat> and we were talking about toxa, toxoplasmosis. Oh, yeah. yeah. And how yeah. When, when mice get infected with it, it makes them attracted to cat urine or less afraid of cats. Right. And it makes sense because the parasite is encouraging right. the host to get eaten so it yep. can continue Just its keep own life cycle. replicating itself. So yeah, that's knowing actually cool. You know, the way it does that is it, uh, it actually like reduces the anxiety of the of the mouse mm -hmm. um and so then the mouse like uh it's like you euphoric know, almost yeah it's like it's it. like oh i'm not i'm not i don't worry about that cat it's cool right yeah. right and, and so the microbes in our body do that a lot they affect our, our mood a lot i was just gonna say so mm. in order to encourage their own uh survival i mean they could have evolved to influence our behaviors to totally. make us eat a particular way or behave a particular way yeah. so that they can you know encourage their own proliferation absolutely it's a and it's a two-way street right like we in the same way they influence us we influence them it's it, like i see these biosynthetic pathways for neurotransmitters right that goes both ways when we receive when we uh uh express like cortisol and stress hormones mm -hmm. bacteria can respond to those hormones in our blood and then they'll turn on their own stress responses so mm -hmm. bacteria have a stress response so we, you know uh, in the lab will you know they'll change the whole way they express all their genes based on if they're being exposed to like you know, some kind of heat stress or acid stress or something like that. Like they go into defense mode or they swim away or things like that. Right. And so they'll actually be turn on those stress responses in response to our stress hormones, which is pretty crazy. Because you're the host is stressed. Right. Therefore we need to be ready because like something might be stressed. happening. Right. Like, yeah. And so, you know, cause we turn on stress response, for instance, if, if we eat a poison, right. Like we'll turn on a stress response. Um, and then the bacteria probably also want to know about that poison, you know? So, wow. Yeah. So just how complex is this area of science? Because like I said, I feel like every day I'm learning something Sounds new. Pretty complicated. Well, did, don't they say the universe, then the gut, isn't it like yeah. that? Like, it's like, it's seriously, aren't those like the two, like most <laughs> complex I mean, I, things? Totally. It's, you know, and it is extremely complex. And so there's sort of a fine line to walk here, right? There's all this excitement about like the fact that we've really discovered this, like, whole other organ system of our body really or like come to appreciate i should say this whole other organ system of our body in the last like 20 that's a to great years. way to put it it's a whole nother organ system that's a very very good way to put it yeah and like it is extremely complex right more complex than any other organ in our body right like a a liver has like like I say one set of genes but the microbiome not only has all these you know tens of thousands of more genes it's also uh, ever changing, right? Like it's not fixed. So your microbiome today is going to be very different than your microbiome in a month or in a year. 
um, potentially. And so, and, and a lot of behavioral change, you mentioned antibiotics, that's a big one, but there's a lot of small things. You just stress alone can really affect your microbiome or lack of sleep has been shown to affect the microbiome and cause shifts. And, um, you know, obviously diet and, and exercise, all these things affect the microbiome and change it all the time. So that is phenomenally important, not just for your metabolism, but also if you think about mood changes, like a lot of those things are mediated by the microbes that you're now kind of supporting or pushing away with those behaviors. Is it is it the diversity of it that is what, is what causes, for example, um, you know, I have psoriasis. So me and like four other people I know have psoriasis, all will uh, get it either expressed differently or from different things, right? So yeah. like there's certain things like sugar is mine, mm -hmm. triggers, they it flares over crazy. My friend, not at all, eats bananas or something. Is that why? Is it the diversity that is it and, and in the way why it's being expressed so uniquely in each individual? It's definitely, the, the description, the, what you're describing is definitely at least in part uh, mediated by the microbiome. And like basically you're putting food in and then it's transforming that into other molecules that either activate your immune system or go into your bloodstream and create some sort of kind of hormonal response or something. And, and that'll be different based on, you know, the constitution of your microbiome versus, you know, friends um, and, and what kind of what is being expressed out from the inputs you put in. And, and so since you have a sort of a different machine than they do, then that's going to be um, what creates those differences in terms of the diversity. Diversity is like the one thing. So to your question as well, like, uh, you know, uh, sorry, I was, uh, when we think about like the complexity of the microbiome, right? That like there's, you know, how much do we really know? All we really know is that it impacts a lot, but we don't really understand how or why to yet in regards to what people say. And like the one thing we do know is that diversity is super important and diversity we express in two ways. First, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the richness of the microbiome and then the evenness. And so the richness of the microbiome is basically like, how many different kinds of bugs do you oh, have in I your see. gut? Mm -hmm. And then the evenness is like, how evenly are they expressed, right? So you, if you and I both have a hundred different bacteria in our gut, that's you know obviously a way underestimation, but, um, and uh, then we have the same richness, but if 95 of yours are the same, and uh, and then you know the other 5% are made up of the rest, then that's a very uneven microbiome. Whereas if I have like a perfectly even spread of 1% of all 100 different bacteria, then I have a perfectly even, perfectly rich. And what is that signaling or what is that telling us? So we know that like richness, having a lot of richness and diversity is really important. Um, and, and, and we think that that's because it, it increases the number of biological functions we can do at any given time. So if we have mm. a stress response, we have the bacteria in there ready to go to respond to that or, or create the beneficial thing, or if we're eating different kinds of food in our diet, that we can extract the nutrients from that effectively and, um, and, and not have like an outgrowth or bloom of like one kind of bacteria because the other ones are kind of keeping it in check. Um, yeah, that's a lot of it, right? Is 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 balancing each other out. Right. Like if there's too much of one, then you'll get some positives, but then you probably will, won't get any of the positives of having other bacteria that can do other things for you. Exactly. Like the analogy I've used in the past is like sort of like a flea market, right? That like if you have like stalls that sell like clothing and then furniture and tools and toys, right? Like if you have all these things, then when, when any customer comes in, you can serve them effectively, right? But if you have all of your stalls are selling only furniture, then if customers are coming in looking for clothes, you won't be able to serve them well. And so um, the microbiome is kind of like that. You want stalls of all different varieties. So you want a lot of different kinds of microbes. And the best way to do that right now, since we don't have a better solution, um, so bacteria eat fiber. Um, and so that's, you know, mostly comes from plants. Um, and so you basically want to eat a lot of different kinds of fiber. Mm -hmm. So if we mm -hmm. often think of fiber as like a thing, but fiber is actually just kind of a category of, you know, infinite number of different kinds of molecules that the bacteria can eat. And so um, you want to eat lots of different kinds of fruits and vegetables. And that's the most effective way to really harbor like a, a rich and even uh, microbiome. So the old adage of like trying to eat for color and all that yeah. like has some validity. That totally. Makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. What do we know about the microbiome and performance? Like, do we see a, a like a fingerprint or a trend of a type of microbiome in like high performing endurance athletes or strength athletes versus let's say the average person? Yeah, totally. It's it's super fascinating, and I and I still can't get my head around the cause and effect like relationship here, but. We definitely, they, there have been interesting studies that have been published really recently, like as we've been able to collect more data on different people's microbiomes more easily. So they'll like look at endurance athletes or high performance athletes and, and compare them to the rest of us slobs and basically show that like um, th that people who have, like high endurance athletes have, have certain functions um, that uh, in, in much higher levels than, than people who 
uh, than, than non-endurance athletes, like the ability to produce certain short chain fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, um, propionic acid was like one that was identified in a recent paper. And so, uh, it, you know, it has this anti-inflammatory activity. And then they also have microbes that are more capable of breaking down lactic acid, uh, than mm. an average person does. And mm. so like there's sort of this enhanced ability to basically deal with all of the stress you put on your body when you exercise, right? Like exercise is really good for you, but obviously it is a stressor and it creates a lot of mm. reactive oxygen species and inflammatory molecules. And so th the people who are training this every day of their lives have microbes that can help them deal with that better, which I don't understand why that is, but they do. Yeah, and and so and you said cause and effect. I'm right. glad you said that because either the the adaptations that you induce through exercise, right? Are they also, trained and then got that. Yeah, causing or, the bacteria to adapt in a particular way, or genetically they're predisposed to have these bacteria, which then helps them perform at higher levels. I, and yeah. We don't know which chicken one is, or the egg. Right? And, and I think it could be both, right? That you could be somebody who works out a lot and then like you know you kind of hit a plateau, right? And then like if somehow you get seeded into your gut a really valuable kind of species that then is able to outgrow then you can maybe burst through that plateau. So what you're saying mm. is if you want better performance, you should have sex with a high-performance athlete and I get mean, their microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just That's what I got eat, out of eat the same food as that baby. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the other yeah, way you yeah, can yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, up, it's up to you. There's a PG version yeah, of that. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, it depends. Cool. Like, if you meet LeBron James, it's, you got to decide what you're going to do with like LeBron James. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll have lunch with him. Individual decisions. I'll go ahead and have lunch with him. We'll just see where it goes. So, okay, so this is very fascinating. So now what about the difference between men and women. I know men and women, we have uh, different hormone profiles. Um, our bodies tend to utilize nutrients very similarly, but in some cases a, a little bit different. Do we see trends in microbiomes in men versus women? You know, that's a good question. Honestly, I, I haven't personally looked into that. I would be surprised if we didn't, uh, just based on, you know, different uh, hormonal balances and, and different uh, behavior types, you know, generally, uh, you know, all those things, right? Like, uh, it's both genetics and it's also society, right? Like yeah. the way we behave is different. And so, um, I, I, you know, if you control for all those things, are there, are there fundamental differences? I would expect that there still would be, as I say, just because the biologies are different, but I don't, I'm not familiar with any like specific research on that. What about the, speaking of women, what about the, the, because we think of the microbiome as it being in our gut, but we also have a, a distinct, uh, bacterial, I guess, I don't know, profile in our mouth on our eyelids, in our armpits, you know, in our groin. And in women, there's, they have a vaginal uh, microbiome. Yeah. And what do we know about that? How important is that? Because I, I do know that in some many cases, women will take antibiotics and they increase their chances of getting things like yeast infections and totally. stuff like that because obviously it disrupts their, their yeah. vaginal microbiome. Actually, that's a, you know... A Glad you brought that up. Like, right, we often we talk about the microbiome, it's usually just like shorthand for the gut microbiome because it's the one that's the most... It's the it's the biggest site of, but you're right that you have microbiomes everywhere, and so yeah, your mouth, your skin, uh, and the vaginal microbiome is a really interesting microbiome in that it's a lot simpler uh, than some of the other microbiomes that we have in our bodies, um, and so it's uh, it's largely bacterial, whereas like the rest of your body has like other microbes in it as well, and um, and and it's largely like a you know a single kind of set of uh, type of bacteria like lactobacillus which produce acid and so they keep a, a balanced ph in the vagina and mm. that's really important for overall vaginal health exactly and, and preventing yeast infection so like you know yeast is a, a fungus essentially and so bacteria usually are, are in there protecting you and so um it's actually a really in terms of where i think microbiome research should be in terms of having the best effect on human health and the, like the lowest hanging fruit, um, it's really there because it's a simpler microbiome. Oh, easier to study. Right, yeah. Oh. It's, it's easier to access, right? It's it's uh, it, it's less complex community. So it means that like um, there are, right? If you change less something- Less variables. Right, exactly, exactly. If you change something in the gut, like you're going to change like a thousand other things too, right? And so the simpler the community, the more direct your changes will have a positive effect. Mm. And so um, it's a huge opportunity Because right, they do stool samples, right? But right. then it's like old uh, yeah. examples. It's like yeah, the, yeah, right, right. It's so, like the it's losers. From the past. Yeah, yeah, from the past. You're yeah. not getting a real time. How, so hard to how do they study the microbiome in the gut then? Because if you study stool, well, that's those are the guys that lost. Yeah. Uh, so how do they do they go directly in the gut and study it while it's in the gut? There's been, there's another area, of another place where scientists like to argue a lot. Um, but yeah, it, it's exactly, you know, 
the vast majority of the cases when we're studying the gut microbiome, it's using stool because it's the easiest to, to access and least invasive. But there have been studies where they compare basically how accurate is that as a sampling of the gut. And so they will go in with a scope one Got way it. or the other and uh, basically take samples um, and then compare those like direct samples to what they see in the stool. And they see that there are some really important differences. So one example this is my favorite one um, is uh for a long time, you know, you mentioned antibiotics earlier, right? And that like we know for a fact, right, that antibiotics massively disrupt the microbiome. And, and so for a long time, um, there was sort of this hypothesis that, um, and I think it's a very flawed hypothesis, I'll get into why, but that we, then we should take probiotics after we take antibiotics, right? Because you should put good bacteria back, right? right? But yeah. um, uh, they actually showed that, um, I'm trying to think of the order of operation for the story. Like they showed that basically that, the, I'll, I'll tell the punchline first, that, uh, pro, uh, probiotics inhibited or it did not help and possibly even inhibited the recovery of your microbiome after mm. antibiotics. Um, wow. And the reason for that is probably that the bacteria that are in probiotics are a pretty narrow set of bacteria, right? And you have this extremely rich and diverse microbiome that also uh, doesn't really, isn't really constituted of the in very high quantities with the bacteria that are in probiotics. So it's typically lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, which are not part of a healthy yeah, there's like microbiome. four of them and that's it yeah pretty much so it's right. like cutting your hand but then you're putting a band-aid on your toe yeah right or like <laughs> cutting your hand and then like putting like a like a, a you know a ball and socket on the on the end of it like it's kind of like a hand and so like it basically and so what it was doing is that basically those bacteria are getting in there and basically getting in the way of your good bacteria going back and so a much stronger hypothesis for how we could recover our microbiome after antibiotics is by taking prebiotics or like fibers, like I was talking about earlier. Oh, just feed them. Feed, right. Like, so they can, you know, so rather than going and trying to plant a different grass in your lawn after, you know, you have a disaster, just go and put fertilizer and let the seeds grow back so, up. Okay, so, so it'd be like this, like, because antibiotics are essentially like a nuke. Like you drop a nuke on a city right. and you kill most of the people. And then what you're saying is, okay, now that nuke went off, most of the people are dead. Let's drop some food so that the rest of the survivors now can repopulate versus... Exactly. Throwing in brand new, you know, brand soldiers, people, yeah, right. or, or aliens that never yeah. lived there in the first place, which are now going to keep killing off all your your get, native, get in the way, get in the way. And, and there's this interesting thing too about sort of like this, like we have this imprint or memory for our microbiome, which I, as far as I know, we like we as a scientific community do not understand how that happens. But basically, what's weird is that while your microbiome is ever changing, there's generally a set structure that gets set pretty early in life, and you don't deviate. Or your body often naturally goes back to that to some level of that state, and they don't really understand why or how that is, and it's probably some kind of relationship you establish early on in development. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, like you know, your your microbiome will probably snap back into shape at some point. It just takes longer and longer depending on what kind of stuff you're putting in there. And so, if you're putting good food in there, not just the microbes that survive, but all, it, uh, but the whole network will come back. You know, and so um, if you put in something alien in there, it's just going to get in the way of that happening. Basically. Interesting. Now, mm -hmm. is it true that our that generationally our diversity of microbiome is starting to to lessen, and they're 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 blaming this on antibiotics and C sections and you know yeah. uh, stuff like that? Is that true? I, it is in the sense that I, I think I think that the the reasons are speculative, but it is true that we I mean we know that or really the effect is you know it's hard to know right because we. We have very limited, you know, knowledge of what our microbiome looked like before, you know, modern genetics. I mean, yeah, our best bet is just modern hunter gatherers, I guess. Well, how else would we study it? Exactly, and and they're just living a different lifestyle, right? And so, and, and we and we know that any lifestyle is going to necessitate a different microbiome. Like theirs is no better than ours. It's just. Uh, you know, uh, something that's responded to their own mm -hmm. lifestyle and behavior. And then we also found like these crazy, like petrified stool samples from like, you know, cavemen <laughs> and stuff. And they've done some microbiome sequencing of them and made some estimates, which is insane. Uh, but it's hard to know. But what we do know is that our microbiome responds to what we give it. Right. And so you're right that we know that, that, uh, antibiotics stress or, or disrupt our microbiome. We know that we're eating. So 75% of the food in the grocery store is from like I don't remember exactly the number, but it's basically like something like 12 plants and five animals or something, yeah. right? Like, so like we eat a much less diverse diet than um, maybe others uh, ate in the past, uh, way in the past. Um, and, and so, you know, we're just, you know, not just eating random leaves off trees for better, really for better probably. But I mean, that is going to affect your microbiome and your microbiome is going to optimize to what you put into it. And mm -hmm. so C-section is actually a really important one. You get about a third of your microbiome as a baby from the vaginal birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like you take that out of the equation and, you know, and not to say that C-sections are bad or anything, but it's like that is a, is a, is a downstream consequence of doing that. And so you got to find other ways, right, to get your microbiome and you, you get it from breastfeeding and just, you know, from putting your mouth on things as a baby basically. But, um, you know, that's, 
that's a, a, a challenge that needs to be solved. Yeah, right. I, so go ahead, Justin. Oh yeah, no, I gotta ask like when you first fell in love with petri dishes. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, uh, I used to. It's funny. I look back. I, my mom sent me like a uh, like a picture around Halloween. Like that. I, like I kind of forgot I did this, but I was like seven or eight. I like you know. I for like three years, I just looked like as a mad scientist for Halloween. Like I think I <laughs> always had this like attraction to science. Um, I'm glad uh, you asked it because actually, what I wanted to ask is along those lines. We jumped right into throwing oh, fastballs yeah, at you yeah, right yeah. away. We were uh, I it. love it. We we're but quizzing we, you right away. We didn't. Yeah. E we didn't even give the audience uh, your background and how you even started to obviously fall in love with this topic. Like, what led you here? Like, yeah, it's kind of a. I, I think is a pretty circuitous path and I'm amazed I ended up here when I look back on it because it was definitely not where I had my sights set when I started. Um, but I did always love science as a kid. And although I didn't ever, I didn't know what it was to be a scientist. Like I didn't know that was like a job. Like I just like knew like, you know, I liked like Thomas Edison and like inventors and, and like solving problems with science sounded cool to me, but I didn't really know what you would do with that. And so, you know, when I went to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I, I ended up, uh, taking a lot of science classes because I liked them. And then, um, but I also really liked like classical history. And so I was like, I studied like that a lot too. And so I was kind of all over the map basically. And then after I finished college, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And so I was sort of like, I was working at a bar. Um, and so I just kind of kept doing that. And then I was working in construction for a little while. And then, you know, but I, I still had the itch for science. And so then I, I you know, one day I just woke up and I was like, you know, I, I should just try this. So I went on Craigslist and looked for like literally just like, typed in like science jobs and like I had no idea what I wanted. Science <laughs> jobs. Yeah, yeah. And like- uh, It's actually a Cra Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And on up, Craigslist. Like, which yeah. is and this was like 2000 results. and like you mean you roll up to some dude's house. Right? You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it's like right. his garage. He's yeah. got, we're we're going to make Come something. on back here, Zach. Yeah, one ad for a meth lab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Totally. totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was a lot of like, you know, uh, RVs and little desert ads <laughs> and stuff. Luckily, I didn't get one of those jobs. But yeah, just I got a job at like this chemistry lab testing soil and water samples for, you know, contaminants in the in the environment. and. It was super interesting work and it, and it really like, I'd say the importance of that job is just kind of open my eyes again. Like, oh yeah, man, like you can do science as a career. And I didn't really, really realize that or, or appreciate that, but the chemistry wasn't really my passion. And so I ended up getting a job at an HIV lab at UC Davis. And, and, and I knew that at that point I was really kind of honing in on microbes and I, I was really focused on disease at that time. Cause that to me was like the problem to be solved, right? If you yeah. have a disease, you want to fix that. Um, and so I was really passionate and interested in that. And so I decided to go back to school and get a PhD in microbiology. Um, and uh, through kind of like a, a set of circumstances that is probably a long and, ter and pretty uninteresting story, uh, I like basically found my, I was really focused on HIV and, and that's a virus. And I was really interested in viral, viral uh, microbiology, but then I kind of like fell into this like bacterial uh, microbiology lab and was doing research in bacteria. And I was like, I love this. And like that for me was like, you know, totally a game changer at that point. I was like, I can't believe how cool these things are and all the stuff that they do for us. Um, and, and, and how amazing they are. And so basically, you know, that was really when everything, you know, when I started to see kind of the light of like where I was headed, um, I was still sort of focused on disease in the beginning, but I started to appreciate more and more that like every day in lab, when I was researching this bacteria, I was making edits to its, you know, DNA and like, it would just do something new and like, I could make it glow green or I could like, you know, make it like break down the sugar or whatever. And, and it was like, this is incredible. And so mm -hmm. then it was just like, for me, like this is logical next step, right? If I'm trying to solve problems for people, it's like, how do we take that and then like, you know, engineer microbes, do something beneficial. So anyway, that was sort of like the, and then after my PhD, I was designing clinical trials for drug companies for a while because I was interested to see kind of how it was to take a product to market via drug. Um, and then, you know, and then I started basically my company, Zbiotics, after that. How'd you, like, how'd you like that process of going through the, uh, the, yeah, the I clinical hear, trials? Yeah, I, I want to hear a little bit about that. That's totally. Cool. That was a really cool experience. I did that for a year in Miami after my PhD. Um, and it was cool because we got a, basically the position I was in, I was just, we'd have clients come in and it was like everything from like, you know, two scientists in a lab or a doctor who noticed a side effect in a drug he was already using all the way up to like, you know, the big five pharma companies, like, you know, designing clinical trials for like a whole pipeline of drugs and stuff. And so I got to see the whole gambit of things. And it was basically like, they come to us and they'd be like, okay, here's a drug. Here's what we think it does. Like, how will we test that? Like, how do we design the study to show that it works? And like, what are our key endpoints and how we design that study? And there's a lot that goes into it. It was really involved. And so I learned a lot about the business of deciding on a product. Um, and also like, how the science and the, and the effect size of the drug really impacts how it's taken to market. And that honestly, like when I looked at that, that two scientists in a lab and saw 
all they were trying to do was because the process is so involved, which I think is a good thing, um, but it just means that all they're trying to do is basically scrap together enough data so that one of those big pharma companies would acquire their drug and take it to market themselves. And pay it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the cost of, t of, of inception to passing through trials and then getting approved is like... How many millions? Or, you, I think it's a billion or hundreds of millions. Right? Hundreds of millions. I mean, it depends on the complexity of the drug and the clinical trial, but yeah, I mean... You know, an average price tag is definitely in the tens or hundreds of millions. Yeah, one of my favorite stories is Viagra. That was a, a blood yeah, pressure blood pressure drug. Blood pressure drug, and yeah. then the side effect was, well, you know, it yeah. kind of lowered my blood pressure, but I got boners. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we're oh, gonna yeah. use it for. We can we can we can we can sell that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got to ask you this question because you talked about viruses and bacteria. I, there's, uh, I've read this, and there's always this debate. I know bacteria are living. Are viruses alive? Oh man, the age old argument. Yeah, uh, it depends on how you define alive. I think it's ridiculous to not call them alive. Live. I okay. mean, they are totally right. They're executing biological functions. They have DNA or RNA, you know, and they they basically, you know, the argument that they're not alive is that they they have to exist in another cell, like in one of our cells. They have to like borrow our machinery. But I mean, that's like that's then by that argument, you would call any parasite that's a good right. point uh, uh, not alive. And it's like and so it's just it's just a more needy parasite. But yeah, I think it's alive. For okay, sure. all right, good. That's yeah. good. That's yeah. that makes a lot of sense. All right, so here's the million dollar question, right? So we're we're learning now that the microbiome and bacteria have tremendous impact on behaviors and you know functions of our body, and it helps us produce you know neurotransmitters. I know serotonin is a big one, and um, you know dopamine, and it helps us just, with our hormones. So, in essence, it's just it's just other organ, like you said, in our body. So the and you talked about modifying bacteria to get them to do certain things. It feels to me like that is a potential panacea of of solutions. Yeah, for a lot of our problems, if they have this much of an influence over us, is this like a big area of science where we could take bacteria, modify them? to help us do certain things like reduce anxiety, depression, improve our body's ability to absorb nutrients or help us with our insulin levels? Like, is this like a big area of science? Totally. I mean, it's becoming one, right? Like, uh, a lot, along with our ability to appreciate the impact of the microbiome in the last 20, 30 years, that coincides with our ability and, and is very much related to our ability to basically like read, write, and edit DNA, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and DNA is really just like the blueprints for the factory, right? If you think of the, if you think of a bacteria or any living thing as a factory that's just performing a bunch of functions in, an, in a coordinated and organized way, um, DNA just tells you like what functions it's going to do at what times and when. Um, and so that's a huge opportunity, right? Like uh, if, if we think about the microbiome, then it's just sort of a collection of functions that's happening in your body, right? And, the, and they're having some impact on you, right? Then we could take a probiotic, a bacteria that you already eat and is already involved in your body and then uh, and program it to execute some useful function for you, right? And that, like that to me is like a really obvious extension of what we're doing, right? Like it, it, we're already eating bacteria to get those functions anyway, whether we know it or not. And so why not, you know, sort of leverage that? And so people are starting to do this now. And, you know, us, uh, you know, we're, we're we're one, obviously, of, of but of several, and, and many people are thinking about drug applications and, and different things we can do with this. But you know, I, it's there's a lot of considerations in terms of like what, how complicated do you go, right? Like, uh, you know, everybody wants to go to the bleeding edge, right? Like, what is the most complicated thing that I could solve, yeah. right? But there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of simple things that we can execute, like very simple biological functions that are important. Yeah, well, I was, think we'd probably start there. Well, I mean, was that kind of the the idea with, with Z-Biotics was to go and do the, you know, the hangover thing? Yeah. It's like yeah. low-hanging so fruit. Totally. Yeah, relatable. Yeah, yeah, instead of getting super complex and trying to solve all the world's problems, like, hey, here's some yeah, a simple thing we can do that can really dramatically help people. Yeah, explain that again. So um, it's, I, I, know, I mean, I know that we obviously sell the product and we used it, um, and I know it's the, it's the world's, First and only genetically modified bacteria, I guess, for for you know just for commercial for use or yeah. for sale, right? Yeah. And and explain how it was modified and what it does exactly and why it works the way it does because it really is one of the strangest products I've ever used in my entire life. Yeah. It's, it's so weird that I've had to use it at least ten times before I was before I could believe it because I get a terrible reaction to alcohol every single time and I don't when I use the product. So explain it a little bit how did it work yeah. and what does it do dude i mean honestly first and foremost same it took me many times to truly believe that what i built actually did something uh, like I, I really had to convince myself because i was skeptical but you know to, to both of your guys points exactly that it's something that people can understand and that we could execute really simply and so like it's a simple biochemical reaction 
that we are just executing more reliably in your gut where it matters. So the product works by basically like, I'll start by saying like when you norm, when you drink, um, you know, normally the alcohol is absorbed into your bloodstream and it, you know, it has the effects that it has on, on your body. And then your liver breaks that alcohol down in two stages from alcohol to acetaldehyde and then from acetaldehyde to acetate. And that intermediary acetaldehyde is highly toxic, much more toxic than alcohol. Um, but that endpoint acetate is, is innocuous, it's essentially vinegar. Um, and so the good news is that your liver is very good at doing that full process from alcohol to acetaldehyde to acetate. Um, and so what's kind of one of these things is rarely appreciated because, you know, that's the major source of alcohol metabolism is that a small amount of the alcohol you drink is actually broken down directly in your gut, in large part by your microbiome. Um, and so some of that alcohol is converted from alcohol into acetaldehyde in the gut, but then it does not subsequently convert it from acetaldehyde to acetate very oh. efficiently. So you actually get an accumulation of acetaldehyde in the gut, and then that leaks out into the bloodstream, kind of wreaks havoc out the body, and then your liver takes care of it eventually. Um, and it's but not until you feel after shit like right, that. Right, exactly. And after it's already kind of created all the problems that it's created, right? And so so that was essentially like, it was, it's just a really simple idea, right? Was like, look, there's all these things we can do with genetic engineering, but let's just start by doing one enzyme, doing one chemical reaction that we know is useful in the gut, right? So just turn that same function from the liver, acetaldehyde to acetate, and just move that into the gut with a, with a bacteria. So we just programmed into this probiotic bacteria, the, uh, uh, the ability to express an enzyme, very similar to the one your liver already uses, to convert acetaldehyde that's formed in the gut into acetate directly in the gut so before it's absorbed into the, into the bloodstream. Um, so that's that, that's it. It's a very simple idea. Well, okay, and, and what bacteria is this that, that was used? So the bacteria we started with was a bacteria called B. Subtilis, uh, Bacillus subtilis, and it's a really common environmental microbe. You likely already eat it every day of your life. Uh, it's on fresh fruits and vegetables everywhere. It's also intentionally been used in fermented, fermented foods for a long time, and kombucha, and then there's like a Japanese fermented soybean mm -hmm. called natto. And so uh, B. subtilis is kind of the star of the show in, in those. Okay, and then now how do you do the modification? Is this like right. CRISPR technology? Like, what work. is it? Yeah, so we actually uh, use a really simple technology again as well. We actually just leveraged uh, actually a really complex technology that bacteria invented three billion years ago. Um, and so we, it's, it's really simple for us to do because they do all the hard work. We literally, we don't have to use CRISPR um, or any of those things. That's really us. CRISPR is, is, is scientists leveraging um, a bacterial function, uh, like sort of hijacking it to create edits in, in like okay. a human cell uh, or a eukaryotic cell of some kind. But what we do is actually just use the same process that bacteria already do naturally to edit their own DNA. And so basically when a bacteria is like swimming around in the environment, if it comes across DNA just floating in the environment, which it does all the time when, back, when cells license stuff, it'll just pull in, occasionally it'll pull in some of that DNA and then it will basically see if there's any homology or like any similarities between that piece of DNA and its own genome. And if there is, it'll swap in uh, that new piece of DNA. And it's called homologous recombination. And it does this because bacteria play a numbers game. They basically say like, odds are if there's some similarity between that piece of DNA and my DNA, then it probably came from somebody like me. And maybe that guy has some kind of benefit that I don't have yet, oh, like an antibiotic ooh. resistance cassette or something like that. So it'll grab it and try it out. And if it doesn't work, It'll die, but it's got like you know a billion brothers and sisters, and so they they, they don't care. Um, wow! How long did it take you to find that specific strain that uh, produced the function you wanted? So that that so so that's where kind of modern genetic engineering comes in is that we don't have to like let the bacteria swim around and just find random pieces of DNA. We can just take the bacteria we knew. I already knew I wanted B. subtilis because it's like basically the safest bacteria on the planet, and um and it has this really fascinating ability. Um, to form an endospore, which makes it super resilient. Um, and so they've pulled out B. subtilis uh, spores or bacillus spores from like old glacier ice flows that are 100,000 years old and they're still alive, that they well, just like hunker oh, down wow. in there and they can survive your stomach acid unharmed, which is really important for a product you want to make, right? It gets shelf stable at room temperature essentially forever. So I liked it for that reason. So I picked the bacteria for that. And then I just, I, I and due to genetics, I know it's whole, the sequence of its whole, whole genome. And so I picked a spot on the genome where I knew that I wanted to put in the, my gene of interest. And then I designed a piece of DNA um, that basically ha had the gene that encodes for the acetaldehyde, the enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde, right? And then I put homology on either side of that. And then, so basically I just mix them together in a tube and then I let the bacteria do the work. And then we just oh, wow. select for the ones that had the transformation event. Wow, now are you able to test uh, uh, acetaldehyde levels as well? Or is it just people use it and they feel better? So. We can, in the lab, so the first, you know, when we built it, we basically wanted to see first and foremost that the product was like safe and it, we hadn't altered it in some way that would make it unsafe. And so, you know, there was no antibiotic resistance or, or, you know, 
pathogenicity of any kind. And so we, we did a bunch of work to, to verify that, but we knew they were making a simple genetic change. We knew exactly where we were making it, right? That's mm-hmm. the whole advantage of putting in like homologous regions is that it goes in exactly where the homology is. So we have a lot of like really, really precise control there. Uh, so that was the first thing we did. And then, yeah, we wanted to test to see that it actually worked. Um, and so we were able to basically test in a test tube that if we put uh, bacteria in a tube with acetaldehyde that, and then measure that acetaldehyde that, you know, in a given time later, the acetaldehyde was gone or it had been reduced. And so we could calculate how many bacteria we needed to remove how much acetaldehyde. Wow. And then, so first that was the first test. And then we tested to see, um, you know, basically in gut simulated environments where we put a bunch of acid and, and bile salts and things that you have in your gut. And we showed that the bacteria still were able to function just as effectively there. Um, it gets harder to test it in people um, because, uh, basically like it's hard to sample your gut environment, right? Um, it, you know, it's pretty invasive, like to, to go in and get a colonic sample and mm-hmm. I'll let you use your imagination on how we do that. But we didn't really want to get into that. Um, and so, yeah, so basically we, we decided that like, look, it honestly didn't matter at the end of the day, um, whether or not, like how much acid we were breaking down if people didn't feel better. Right. So right. the end point that really mattered was like, do people mm-hmm. feel better, whether we're breaking down acid or not. And obviously we are you know, we know we're breaking down acetaldehyde, but does it matter to people? Does that actually have a, a positive impact? And so we did some critical studies in both directions, um, but ultimately, uh, you know, before we launched the product and, you know, we surveyed hundreds of people on how they felt the next day. And then we also did some sort of internal kind of placebo controlled testing um, to convince ourselves um, of the product. And, and, and what we saw was that people were, you know, you know, Almost, I think it was like 96% of people said that they felt better the next day after taking the product. And then in our placebo testing, we saw really strong and encouraging results that that, that was due to biological activity. Yeah. You know, it's what's interesting about this from a business standpoint is you can patent something like this, right? And we did. And you did yeah. patent yeah, yeah, it. In yeah. other words, nobody else can do it. Right. So it's almost like, you know, if this is if you're in the if if this science is your field and you're finding ways to solve problems, holy cow, that could be a potentially very lucrative. Uh, you know, part of this of this industry. Now, if you guys have that patent, then what are el- what else are all these other guys using? Yeah, because there's lots of these on the market, and I had tried them. But this is why I was skeptical when we first got together. Right. I was like, ah, I've seen this shit before. Right. None of it, none of it really fucking works. You know, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we had our first patent granted, um, uh, and we have another a, pa- a second patent filed for uh, you know expanding. So basically. The patents are around the the specific function of the bacteria, right? Like we patented a probiotic bacteria that's been genetically engineered to break down acetaldehyde to kind of you know prevent the next day effects of, of drinking. Um, and so that so anybody who engineers any bacteria to do that, it would be in violation of our patent. And then we also have parts of the patent that patent the genetic strategy and sort of the you know the nitty gritty genetics that because you know the special sauce of of our of our strain. But to your point, like what else is out there, like. Basically, when when I looked at this market, when I was first starting to decide how I was going to apply the technology, and I thought this was a cool place to start, everything that's out there right now is just sort of like different mixes of kind of semi-random uh, plant extracts and vitamins, right? And and so the yeah. idea is just the idea that like you're somehow sick or something, and that like if we give you vitamin C and vitamin B, and then and they tell these stories about you know how that's like antioxidant or whatever, and they have like logical kind of rationale for why that might work. But I always said that like if it was just vitamins or like a plant that like made you feel better the next day, then we wouldn't be discovering that in, you know, 2020, right? We, the, we would know about that for like the 6,000 years of human history that people were drinking alcohol. They would have noticed, right? That like, if they eat this plant, I don't feel bad yeah. the next day. And so th- th- those things obviously don't work. Yeah. Um, and they're all the same and they're all just different mixes of the same ingredients and, and they're not, they don't have any like, you know, legitimate. It, sort it of. reminds me then kind of like the, uh, you know, the, 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 comp- the Mana V and yeah. the, the, all the, 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 just basically a bunch of berry juice. Yeah. The side oh, yeah. juice. Right. And that, then they all claim these crazy things. Right. That's, and it's, they're attaching all their science just to basically the benefits behind antioxidants, right, which right. you can go get in a handful of blueberries at exactly. the grocery yeah. store. And it's like, and which are beneficial, but are not like right. magical cures for everything. Right. 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 Yeah. And that's, what's really uniquely different about Z-Biotics compared to everything else on the market. Nobody else is doing any GMO stuff. No, nobody else. No, nobody's doing anything with genetic engineering at all. And like, you know, we really saw a problem, right? And then we like use science to build a, a, a specific solution to that problem. And so people often ask like, oh, what about your competitors? I don't say it to be like flippant or anything, but like, I don't really consider that to be the same thing at all, right? That they're like kind of playing in a different sort of space of, of like hydration and things like that. And like, that's fine. You know, and that, you know, like say, I mean, like, look, antioxidants aren't bad for you. Like, they're, right, they're, right. you know, it, but right. I'm you know, sure somebody is, had Monavie and said it made them feel a lot better. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is a whole different category, right? We're, we're really talking about, you know, the world's first and currently still only genetically engineered probiotic of any kind. And, and 
we are the first and we have a patent on our product, but we are not going to be the last. We know there are other companies working on this and we're actively helping them, right? We want to elevate this category because we see a lot of potential for this technology and all the things it can do for human health just beyond, you know, this is a proof of concept for people to like understand and grab onto and feel the effects of, but there's so many things we can do. So let's talk about that because you, you're you trying to elevate this and we want to grow this, but yet uh, there seems to be this uh, you know stigma around GMO that it's yeah, bad. Right. We were kind of talking about it off air. Share that, like why? Why are, do we think of it as bad? I, personally, I even think of it, like I hear GMO and I think, oh yeah, stay away from that food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll do my best not get my soapbox, but I totally will, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like uh, we, genetic engineering and, and GMO sort of like, a few different things, uh, different issues kind of got conf conflated together, right? We had like, you know, bad business practices or genetic engineering enabling sort of bad, bad business behavior or bad behavior, um, you know, that. And honestly, I truly believe that it was not motivated by bad behavior. That's my own personal take. I think that it just became bad. Like um, the idea around engineering a plant, right, to be more resistant to a pesticide was to enable farmers to get more yield per acre out right. of their, out of their mm -hmm. crops, right? Which is a good thing. We have to feed a growing you know, population of humanity. And so we need to get better yield. But it then sort of morphed into, I think, something that is, it has become pretty negative. And, and I think that customers were rightly concerned about that. Um, but then that got conflated with like safety issues, right? And like the safety of, of glyphosate as an example versus the safety of the genetic engineering itself, right? And so those are two very different things. And so I think first and foremost, that's the problem was that was the initial problem. And then now the bigger problem that's piled onto it is that a ton of brands have seen this as an opportunity to fan the flames of fear in order to sell their product at a higher at a higher price point, right? So they can now put on their label, non -GMO. we're non-GMO, yeah. right? And like, you know, we're organic and and there is no such thing. A GMO, like, you know, I see it all the time, like you see a GMO, like wheat flour or non-GMO wheat flour, excuse me. And it's like, there is no GMO wheat. It doesn't exist. So all wheat that you see on the shelf is non-GMO. <laughs> but, and yet we see <laughs> big non-GMO stickers yeah. like on the, on the, <laughs> on the wheat flour that say so non-GMO. It's like, to, and then they sell it for more. Right. And so, so there, and all, and all yeah. it does is into the, to the, you know, to the co consumer walking to the grocery store, they see this non-GMO butterfly everywhere. And they're like, oh, it must be really bad. You know, cause everybody's saying it's so bad and that we don't have it, you know? And it's like, this is not like, and it's not, right? Genetic engineering is a technology, right? And it can be used to make good things or bad things. Like all GMOs are not good. I'm definitely not advocating for that either. It's really just that like, it's a tool. Like if you look at like metallurgy as an example, right? It's a tool and you can make a gun with metallurgy or you can make a spoon with metallurgy, right? And those are two very different things with different safety profiles. And so you wouldn't vilify metallurgy because it can make guns. You vilify the gun if, you, if, if that was your bench or whatever. And so, um, and I think the same with genetic engineering, right? That like building responsible products that can benefit people. I mean, this technology really gives us an amazing advantage to like fight, you know, climate change, like, you know, uh, emerging diseases, like the vaccine was made with genetic, uh, you know, COVID vaccine was made with genetic engineering, right? Like, um, and, and, and problems of, of feeding and growing humanity. These are all like existential crises f facing, hum uh, humanity is facing and, and using genetic engineering is a way we can solve those problems. And so it's really important to, I think, not vilify the technology, but, but make sure that I think it's it's right for the public to be concerned about how it's used and make sure that it's responsibly used. Yeah, it's funny when you read about the potential negatives of GMOs, really what you find is the ones that have any kind of credibility really point to the glyphosates or the pesticides that are sprayed on them and not to the GMO uh, plants themselves. And it's funny because years ago, there was this huge report that came out with protein powders and how they had like out like crazy amounts of heavy metals, heavy metals in some yeah. of them. Yeah, right. And they were the organic ones. Yeah, yeah, right. Because what people don't realize is organic also uses uh, pesticides, but they're not the synthetic ones, but oftentimes can cause this builds up of, of he toxic heavy metals. So people were buying products thinking they were healthier. Right, and they're worse. And they were, they were actually buying things that were totally. toxic. This is one of my other like soapboxes is like, is around the, the whole organic movement and like, Organic farming, it's a is like applying 17th century technology to 21st century problems, right? Like, and the idea that we could go back in time and fix everything is crazy, right? Like, we're feeding, you know, you know, however many like 10x more people than we were feeding when 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 that farming technique was arose. And I understand that the concern is that moving forward is creating its own problems. But to your point exactly, like there was this amazing um, studies that were kind of published in the 70s, 80s, and 90s by this guy um, Bruce Ames, um, and he showed that basically. Uh, he had this really cool test for kind of the mutagenicity of 
using bacteria, the mutagenicity of any product. And so his famous one is he put like a cigarette butt in the middle of like a, a plate of bacteria and showed that they were mutated like crazy and developed antibiotic resistance really fast. And so it was like, we all know that, you know, uh, cigarettes are super mutagenic. And so he was able to show all these different things. And so he tested organic versus conventionally grown fruit and vegetables. And he showed that Orga uh, organically grown fruits and vegetables often have more carcinogens or mutagens in them than conventionally grown counterparts because plants produce their own natural pesticides um, when they're attacked by pests. Um, mm -hmm. That's where we get a lot of them is we just kind of edit ones that already exist. That. And so, and, and you can't wash those off. They're internal to the plant. In fact, and you don't have to, there's no regulations around that because why would you, right? Because it's natural, but like natural is definitely not safe. Like nature is our biggest enemy. All poisons come from plants, right? And they're, they're, they're super toxic. Um, uh, and so this idea that organic is somehow safer for you, and, and to be clear, his conclusion was that like the differences, while the organic was often higher, were negligible compared to the benefits of eating fruits and vegetables. And so his basic thing was like, doesn't matter if they're organic or conventionally grown, eat fruits and vegetables. That's what matters. Well, like, yeah, that's 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 higher mm -hmm. on the, for us right. at least, when we talk mm -hmm. about the priorities of, of nutrition. So we, what are the that. benefits of organic, if any at all? So there is some evidence, I, you know, I don't want to say that there's like no benefit whatsoever. Like there's some evidence to show that in certain fruits and vegetables, uh, in the uh, if they're grown in a way that like doesn't pull them off the vine too quickly or things like that that they acquire more micronutrients um, than than their conventionally grown counterparts sometimes like so hydroponic uh, but that, that again that a hydroponic I don't know but I think that could classify as organic I'm not sure but uh, that would be a delta between you know growing it in soil versus hydroponically and yeah. things like that so well the, the, okay mm -hmm. they're all markets and what right. you, what you find in the health market we see this all the time is they'll say I mean I mean. Low fat, low fat yeah. forever. Yeah, right. only gluten free steaks. Yeah, so. well, exactly. Yeah, right, right, right. It, you know, I mean, uh, red vines. You go to the. You know, I remember yeah. going to the movies and getting yeah, red fat. vines, and it said, you know, a non fat food. Right, right. You know, because they're <laughs> advertising it as somehow it's like healthy. Totally. And natural is one of those things. Totally. And organic gummy bears, right? You yeah, right, organic right, right. Gummy bears. Yeah. And, it's exactly that. Those things drive me crazy. It's like it reinforces this really false perception that like nature is good. Is good, and you know. And like you say, like organic gummy bears are healthy. Organic is healthy or whatever. It's like not no, it's, necessarily it's still a bunch of sugar, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, not necessarily yeah. at all. Yeah, I, I, I feel like because of the impact that the that bacteria have on us, that we're potentially on the cusp of just a revolution in biology by being able to manipulate bacteria to to do what we want. I read an article that they were able to modify bacteria to produce opiates. Yeah. So they were able to make bacteria that could make opiates. So it's like now you can make drugs through bacteria or maybe eat this bacteria and then produce your own drugs. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could, right? And and I think that there are interesting ramifications of, of just ben generally using bacteria and fermentation as a way to manufacture stuff rather than growing a whole plant, right, to manufacture that thing. And opiates is one interesting application, but like a, a cool one is, uh, well, so we used to, as an example, get human insulin from uh, the livers and pancreas of, of cows and pigs. Right. Um, and they literally would drive train car, refrigerated train cars into warehouses and then like load them up with uh, livers and, uh, yeah. and, and pancreases of, of, of like literally hundreds of millions of, of, of these animals every year to give people enough human insulin. Obviously, it's not a sustainable practice at all. And so and you grow up the whole cow just to get that thing, right? yeah. or the whole pig. And so then we figured out a way to, to engineer our bacteria to make human insulin for us. And so now in uh, fermenter, the size of your refrigerator, we could accomplish what we were used to be accomplishing with a million Pigs. Oh, wow. I didn't and know like that. it's so that and that, that happened in the it was the first evidence uh, of really successful bacterial genetic engineering that happened in the uh in the eighties. And that now all humans That was a revolution. Are, yeah. And now I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. I didn't even they know. did something similar. I don't know if they did this with growth hormone, but I do know that originally growth hormone was from cadavers. And people would run into issues because they would get the growth hormone from a cadaver and potentially get there was like a disease that they could potentially get from this cadaver. Uh, growth Some hormone kind of or and now i don't know if it's synthetic or if it's made through bacteria but it's different now. yeah that's fascinating we were actually raising animals just for the insulin so yeah. basically raising this big old animal right. all the feed that goes into it killing them all off the shipping that's all involved yeah. it, all for this little bit right of something inside of them that's wild to me and that's a dramatic example but it's true for everything right even if you look at like uh, you know, you extrapolate that, right? Like, like, look at corn as an example, right? We grow up the whole plant and we just take the ear off, right? And then we just throw away the rest, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, or like, you know, like casein and milk, right? You know, like, um, you know, casein is a great protein. We put in protein powders and stuff, right? We grow this whole cow. We have to feed it to keep it alive and keep all these functions going just to milk it every day and get the milk out of it, right? Yeah. And then sometimes even just throw away parts of the milk and just get the protein. It's like, we can engineer our bacteria 
to grow, to make that casein way more efficiently than growing up a whole wow. cow that's like farting and burping methane into the environment, right? Like, I mean, there's all these things we can do with microbes and genetic engineering um, to replace like really like horrible practices that humanity has put on this planet in terms of agriculture, right? Like agriculture we think of as like this natural thing, but it's actually the most unnatural thing we've done to the planet is covered in farmland and like make chickens and cows the most successful animals on the planet. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's crazy, right? Like, uh, so, you know, using genetic engineering, we can actually move beyond that really blunt ax we're using to try and like feed humanity. Wait, wasn't there recently hmm. a discovery that there was a direct connection between the gut uh, microbiome in the brain that they had yeah. just discovered like this what was it that gut they found barrier. yeah yeah the gut brain axis is like this been a really hot topic lately and it's awesome because we've sort of figured out like you know there's like a a gut skin axis and like a lot you know more and more it shouldn't be surprising in hindsight right that like these things are so interconnected right mm -hmm. like that your brain right if you think your brain is sort of like a central control unit for your body and like it has like all these nerves going out sort of these like you know these cables going to the rest of your body get, getting inputs and putting outputs it's not surprising that there's a very thick cable or a series of cables running from your brain to the food source, right? The mm -hmm. thing that's keeping you alive um, uh, or the source of, yeah. So like you have this enteric nervous system that's like in your gut is huge, right? And it's like, there's all these very like important nerves that go to have direct connections to your brain. And the bacteria that are living in your gut are literally plugged in directly into that nervous system, right? So they're communicating directly with your brain and vice versa. Like we were talking about earlier with like stress hormones and, mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the byproducts of microbial metabolism, they're like, they're pulling this, they're, they're giving direct information. We're having a, a direct chemical conversation with, our bac with bacteria and it's, it's weird to think about, but it is a direct conversation that like we're having with them, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, they they, they connected uh, well loosely some a particular bacteria to Parkinson's and and multiple sclerosis, which I think is fascinating. So I, it makes me excited because as we learn more about this, we can literally start cure, potentially curing so many different issues by creating bacteria that'll do what totally. we want. Totally. And there's like I hate to like overstate because you don't want to overpromise, and I think that that ends up getting science in a lot of trouble is right. you overpromise sure. something and then and then it ends up not being that thing and right. then everybody gets upset about it but like there have been a lot of these a lot of psycho psychological disorders and like and psycho psychological developmental disorders that have been we don't know what the link is or what the causal direction is but that like we see differences for instance very significant differences in the in the microbiomes of people with autism yeah. versus people who don't have autism and so like it's a question of right like what direction is that flowing but the the very clear thing you can take away from that is that there's a very important communication mm -hmm. system that has broken down there. Okay. Hmm. So let's talk again about, about Zbiotics. It's probably one of the companies we work with where the repurchase rate has got to be one of the highest. And usually what will happen is a customer will get, will try it, and then they just they keep getting it. So how has the success been of the company? And what are some of the, have you, been, have you run into any struggles or challenges with trying to grow the company? Yeah, man. I mean, you know, as first company I ever started, I'm a scientist by nature. So obviously <laughs> uh, I did not make all the perfect decisions. Like, yeah, so yeah, we, we, we're, you know, classic startup woes, no doubt about it. Uh, but I mean, yeah, we've been growing a lot lately and as we kind of started to figure those things out. And so, um, yeah, repurchase rate is high. It's great to have a great product. Um, you know, the product when we convince the problem is right. Like there's a lot of skepticism in the category. And so we have to really overcome that and, and really explain to people the pro why the product is different and how it works. And, but if we're able to do that, and particularly if, you know, the value prop is correct for people, um, we, you know, we see that people are really sticky with this product, um, and they really love it. And so typically we see that like, for some people, it's the first time they try it. And for others, like you or me, uh, you know, this can uh, sometimes uh, take two or three tries to really believe that the way I feel better. And we get all kinds of weird responses. People will say like, uh, like classic, this like conversation I had like a hundred people is like, I'll say like, oh, you know, you know, after they've tried the product, they'll be like, you know, how do you feel today? And they're like, oh, I feel great. And I'll be like, oh, you know, uh, and, and they'll say, but like, I don't think it was because of Zbiotics. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know did, you, what, did you not drink very much? Like, no, I had like, I had like seven drinks and usually on three or four, I usually feel like pretty crappy the next day. And I'm like, okay. So, so then in the back, like, yeah, but you know, I, I had like a glass of water before bed. And I'm like, <laughs> so you think that like a single glass of water is like the, <laughs> the, the solution to this problem that nobody's ever thought of before. Or something. So people like really have struggled to sort of attribute the benefit to the product. Um, and so we it sometimes take a little bit more convincing. But basically, once people are hooked in, we see that they're like just customers for life, basically. Did you hear the story that I told the guy who DM me who said it didn't work? Did, I, did you hear that story? No, no. Oh, oh so, I, so I had a guy like, hey, this Zbiotic thing doesn't really work. I said, really? And I wanted to hear, well, what did, right. when did you take it? Right. At what time? And how many drinks does this? And, and we're going through his night. And then 
towards the end, I get to hear that he's doing lines of coke. Oh, yeah, right. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> yeah. there's nowhere in here to see Biotic mm, say yeah. it's good. Totally. So you think it's the product that didn't work because yeah, it has right. nothing product. to do with the lines yeah. of coke that you were doing. Exactly. <laughs> and, it, you know, and I think it's really, and that, that brings a good point. Is like it also what we found to be a uh, really important part of our success is like managing expectations appropriately, right? That like this is science, not science fiction. This is not a magical cure all, right? Like yeah. definitely not going to help you with coke or any other drugs. Yeah. Um, and it's only going to help with alcohol, with the acetaldehyde, right? Like that's the chemical breakdown product of alcohol that our product is specifically engineered to deal with, right? And the more alcohol you drink, the more you're going to be dealing with the effects of alcohol itself, right? When you're, when you feel miserable the next day, some of that is due to kind of like the inflammation and misery that acetaldehyde is causing, but some of it is causing to all these endocrine imbalances that alcohol creates right. in your brain it causes poor sleep um it causes all kinds of like imbalances in your in your, your metabolism and all this stuff so the more alcohol you drink the more those symptoms will become magnified and so yes you won't be dealing with the acetaldehyde symptoms but you will still now be dealing with like much more severe alcohol related symptoms well, so that's how i think we exp we try our best to yeah, explain it that right. way is that like it doesn't it, it doesn't cure the fact that you only slept two hours. Right. Totally. You know what I'm saying? Like you still only slept that, which you will always yeah. feel like shit you when you don't Exactly. Tired. And right. even if you're laying in bed for eight hours, if you're drunk, you're not sleeping well. Yeah. And so like, you know, an eight hours of drunk sleep is like two hours of good sleep. And right. then, yeah, exactly. If you're closing the bar down at four in the morning and then, and then going, you know, waking up at 8 a.m. You're like, oh, I feel like crap. It's like, yeah, well, you got like no sleep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> did you, did you watch the video of us uh, do, doing an on-air yes. test? Of the whole <laughs> we did a drinking game. This is not what a fitness podcast should do. <laughs> Tell you that right now. Shot after shot after shot after shot. Take another shot. You forgot to jump in oh, no! 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 Bro, that was the most drunk I've been in at least over a decade. Do not do what we did. I don't think we anticipated getting that destroyed. That, that was way overboard. But here's the trippy part, and this is 100% true. I don't feel nauseous. I don't have a headache. I don't feel dehydrated at all. I feel totally fine. It's absolutely brilliant. It's so brilliant that I actually worry that it's going to increase people's, uh, how much people drink. What's their, what's their tag? Have you seen their tagline? It's uh, drink like there is a tomorrow. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah, if people like say that. drink like there's no tomorrow, it's yeah. drink like there is a tomorrow. Dude. That was <laughs> incredible. Uh, <laughs> I but talk that. about I though how you, control. so off air we were talking before and uh, unfortunately you can't share some of the stuff that you guys were doing because I am, and I imagine is, and tell me if I'm wrong, there's got to be a lot of rules around how you test this. You can't just go get a bunch of people and say, okay, we're going to get you hella fucked up, you know, right. and drink 12 shots like we did. Yeah. So I'm sure you can't legally do that. So how do you work your way around that? And yeah. do you guys still do it for your own so you know, but then you can't publish it and no, talk about it? It's exactly right. I mean, for several reasons, right? Like not only, well, first and foremost, I should say we, we don't, we can't and don't do that because we don't want to encourage people to binge drink, right? Like the goal of the product, and I think one of the reasons why our product really resonates with a lot of mind pump uh, listeners is that it's not about like going out and getting as drunk as you want. Um, it's about like the fact that you're going to go out and socialize like responsibly, but then you have like a morning workout or you have a routine and the more healthy right. routine that you don't want to disrupt. That's really important, especially right during the holidays, you're going to be doing going to a lot of late dinners and like having drinks and, 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 and holiday parties. Right. But, you don't want to fall off the wagon on like the, all the really healthy habits you've built all year. Like right? January shouldn't be like a recovery month from like from just falling off the wagon, right? And so like, that is first and foremost what the product is meant to be for. It's like to enable basically responsible, balanced social and like active lifestyles, opposed right. to like now this is a get out of jail free card for you to go to like Vegas and get as fucked up as you want, right? right. So um, I think so. First and foremost, that's one of the reasons why we don't do it, but you know, to your point, I mean, like, if you really want to know how well the product is working, right, like, uh, it's important to make sure that, that we have enough acid out of hide in the system that we can actually see a benefit. And so obviously like doing a test with like two or three drinks is be really hard to tell the difference between, you know, uh, like uh, on a clinical level. So yeah. we had to design a test that kind of like, you know, met the kind of towed that line, right. That got people, you know, uh, drunk enough that where we could see a difference, but that wasn't so drunk that like it was dangerous or risky or bingy. Um, and so we did do those tests internally. Um, and we probably pushed the border a little bit more because we really wanted to get a nice signal to noise ratio there. Um, and we saw like just really incredible results, but unfortunately because we got people pretty drunk, like there are <laughs> ethics board approvals that say that you can't publish Damn. a study like that. Right? Uh, nerds getting in the way again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So understandable. Like it's, you know, you know, they, there are rules for reason, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of, you know, what it could enable for the public to believe about like, you know, cause our product does not make alcohol any safer or more healthy, right? Alcohol is still damaging. Right. But so I understand why they want us to be careful, but 
uh, you know, we had to validate internally, right? Like, right I'm right. not going to go out there and start this company. Like I can do a lot of things with my science, right? I can sweep vitamins in a bottle like everybody else, right? Yeah, like yeah. I can be a lot easier than the, than, than well, the science. we had the same idea. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, we tested it to the limit. Yeah. Totally. Sure. Yeah. Justin, for sure. Well, yeah. I actually noticed it even at, so because, uh, and I don't know how much you know this or I've shared with you, but I actually like never drink. I t tend to lean toward, I'd rather smoke marijuana if I'm going to go do something, if I'm going to party or socialize like that. Um, and I never drink. And the reason why, because two drinks and I just guts fucked up, sleeps totally. fucked up, just, and I would, it, and it doesn't mean I never did. It's like once a year I would, because it was like, it just wasn't worth what I had to deal with the next day where now I've just made it a habit. Even if I'm just going to have one or two drinks, which now I can do on a more regular basis, I still don't drink a lot, but now like when, you know, Katrina and I go to dinner where I would never have a glass of wine with her, I'll have a glass of wine on a, on a Thursday night. Because I know I can take that and have one or two glasses and actually not feel the, are the there same effects. Are there genetic variances between people in terms of how negatively acetaldehyde affects them? Because I'm like Adam. like It would take me a couple drinks and I would feel terrible. Yeah, like totally. That. It's yeah. both, right? I mean, there's definitely genetics involved. And we in, Hangover is actually a really interesting uh, and complicated, <laughs> as it turns out as I dug in, uh, really interesting and complicated sort of like you know, symphony of things is kind of happening in your body. Um, and so there's some level of genetics, although we don't fully understand it, but there's definitely a role of the microbiome, right? So, it, you know, and, and you notice this, right? If you go out uh, drinking on two separate occasions and they seem like they're very similar nights, um, you know, you might feel really miserable one morning and then the next morning you might wake up uh, and, and not feel so bad. And a lot of that has to do with, with the const constitution of your microbiome and how you're processing that alcohol and that acetaldehyde, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of good studies to show, we do know, right, that like, and that's the whole premise of Z-Biotics, right, is the acetaldehyde that forms in your gut is what's really a huge problem. And different microbiomes will produce different amounts of acetaldehyde. Um, so that is a big difference in between people. And, and, uh, and as I said earlier, like your microbiome, while it changes a lot, um, there's also parts of it that stay really consistent. So if you're a kind of person who, who develops a predisposition for sensitivity to acetaldehyde, it's probably because you have a microbiome that's producing more than somebody else who doesn't, mm. who's doing less alkyl metabolism in the gut. Okay, so Sal asked you, uh, you know, uh, the hundred million dollar question. Where I have one of my own. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, hard alcohol before beer. Are you in the clear? Or <laughs> so, beer before alcohol? Beer yeah. before liquor. You never. Beer been before sicker. liquor. Never been sick. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. So definitely not. Uh, really, <laughs> the saying should just say, "Don't rip shots at the end of the night." Basically, like you know, when you're drinking, it's alcohol per unit time is all that matters. Um, okay. And so. Uh, it's a lot easier when you're drunk and don't have any inhibitions, and it's you know 145, and you to take like three shots oh, yeah. than it is at 145 to pound three beers. Like that's a lot harder. Um, and so basically, that's a behavioral thing. It's not really like oh, any, interesting. Any chemical. Hmm. There's thing no science it. there. No. That was uh, interesting. If anything, actually, the carbon, you know, alcohol is much less diluted in a, in a beer. But if you were to, if you were to, like, let's say, like shotgun, the equivalent beers, amount, right, you probably exactly. feel worse even. You would because oh, wow. we actually know the carbonation, uh, you know, basically uh, puts pressure on your stomach lining and you absorb the alcohol faster. And so wow. the more, the faster oh, you absorb wow. alcohol and the more it spikes your your blood alcohol content, the more likely you are to be hungover. Are there um, differences though, like in say, because for me, like rum, I just have a really bad reaction, or wine specifically. I he guess. gets like, naked he, right away. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one. I mean, that could be a good product. or bad reaction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bad bad one. Okay. But no, I have way worse. His bad one is just the three of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I drink one of those two things. Yeah. And so is there any sort of uh, differentiating factors there? There's a few things like um, that could be at play there. And so some of them are, you know, no less real, but like are psychological. Uh, a, you associate that. And B, that association may have developed over time in the in the context in which you were drinking that alcohol, right? Like, so like mm -hmm. you're much more likely, for instance, to take like tequila shots um, or drink it in a sugary margarita than you are to like, you know, take shots of like a nice whiskey or something like that. So mm -hmm. like those sort of things like are what create, sometimes can create a hangover. And then that being said, there are some chemical things that could be out of play too. So like red wine is an example. Actually, so most of the acetaldehyde you're exposed to is because of your body turning alcohol into acetaldehyde. Mm -hmm. But the alcohol does have some acetaldehyde in it like mm. uh, i mean alcoholic beverages i mean have small amounts uh, they're called congeners they're like byproducts of the the fermentation process that made the alcohol right the, mm. the microbes that actually made the alcohol in the first place um and so usually the amount of acetaldehyde in something or the congener content and stuff is pretty low uh, but red wine is a good example of some red wines have really high levels of acetaldehyde and it's part of the flavor it gives like a sort of a sweet flavor to it um and there are other congeners as well and so it's possible that 
you know, you're just experiencing the direct effect of those molecules in the liquid as opposed to the conversion that was happening in your gut. And so red uh, and dark rum is another really great example. So the, mm -hmm. as a rule of thumb, it's not always true, but as a rule of thumb, typically darker liquors have more congeners in them than uh, clear or light liquors. And so um, a darker liquor is more likely to have to have that be one aspect of what's playing into the way you feel. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. why I stick to vodka. Right. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whiskey. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Zach. I, we, we really enjoy working with you guys, and the science behind what you guys do is just, it's mind-blowing. I mean, you yeah. know how we found you, right? Yeah, right. There was an article that I read, and the author wrote about it and talked about it. And I'm like, this is fascinating. Read the article, and you guys got a bunch of people ordering, you know, bottles. It was crazy. And you guys contacted us, but... Uh, very remarkable. I'm, I'm really excited to see where this goes in the future because it feels like this is just the beginning. Yeah. I mean, if you can genetically modify surface. bacteria to do what you guys are doing, uh, I can only imagine what other potential products could come in the future. Totally. Yeah, I know we can't talk about those, right. but what what is the timing you think when the next one's coming? Yeah, and I can I can I can tease a little bit. I can at least I can talk in broad strokes. Um, but yeah, I mean. We're looking to launch our second product, you know, hopefully next year, and, and we're hoping to start talking about that soon. Um, and that product is related to kind of like, it, so totally different. That areas. one's for cocaine, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> product too. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it totally. The whole goal right here is to show that we Big can do anything, right? And so, like, you know, the our future products are not going to be related to alcohol. Like, our second product is related to like uh, your your gut and your microbiome and gut wellness. A lot of things you talk about today. Um, so I'm super excited about that product, and mm -hmm. I think that that's a product that'll benefit a lot of people. And then we have a product uh, kind of an, uh, that we're developing right now related to. Uh, recovery, uh, exercise recovery, uh, so better, faster exercise recovery wow. and inflammation uh, related to that. And then we have products related to like sleep and mood that were kind of like are a little further afield and then better nutrient acquisition from our food. Um, these are all things that we're working on right now. And I think products that, like I say, our next product's probably coming in the next year. And then I think like products three, four, and five hopefully are coming in the next like uh, two to three years. So, I, okay, how did you, I mean, why there? Why not the vagina or the right. eyeballs or the hair? Like why, why, why these areas? Why, why, why did you start in all these? Because like, I mean, we really want to start in places where people could really understand the benefits and not to say that there's not understandable benefits on the skin or the vagina, it's like, but uh, people are used to taking probiotics like orally. And so I thought that that was a good place to kind of like, in the gut microbiome is a really important microbiome. And um, so I thought, and there's a lot of kind of things, activities happening and a lot of things we could learn. I would also, so imagine that you're probably looking to identify besides what you said you're looking to identify more simple functions yes. to start like an enzyme that breaks down exactly. acetaldehyde right like that's versus okay there's this complex chain of, of things that we need to make happen and that's going to be a much more challenging process that is exactly right that like the whole premise of zebiotics was the idea that like we could start small and do simple things and build from there right like a higher likelihood of success uh and benefit yeah. for people if we did if we solved with like really simple reactions and a lot of those happen in the gut to your point but like um yeah we do see like we have ideation on products for other microbiomes and not just on your body right like human health is it's right your skin microbiome the vaginal microbiome your oral microbiome these are all super important ones but then right like the microbiome in your shower and the microbiome on your kitchen counter, those are super important microbiomes uh, for your health as well. And we can affect those as well with products. So those are kind of, and, yeah. and microbiome of your pet is also like really important. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of different things we can be doing with these products. Rad, dude. Last question. Okay. okay. The Z and Z biotics. Is that Zach biotics? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it was supposed like I, I, I needed a, a placeholder oh, really? name. Yes. Uh, I hate it. Uh, I, like it makes me look like an egomaniac. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? Hey, this I is uh, it, this dude. is the the science guy first, company guy second. Right. right yeah. Because yeah. it's your first company you're building. That's totally, I think every one of us has named our first business right. after ourselves. Exactly. I mean, we almost <laughs> that was a long we almost named this Adam yes. Pump, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. we got to change A and J that. lawn mowing service. That was my first. Yes, it was absolutely. I had to throw it in there. I know. I like I need a placeholder for like a pitch competition, and so I was like, ah, oh, zebiotics, and I was like, I'll fix it later. And then like it just kind of stuck. And then we did like all these naming exercises, and people just like liked that it was sort of like the Z was like sciencey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fine. Mysterious. I guess we'll call it. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's awesome. That's well, great. Well, cool. This would be a great, co great conversation, man. Thanks right. for coming in. I yeah, appreciate thanks a lot, it. man. This is really, right. really fun. Also, awesome. hey, look, if you like that whole episode. Click right here for shorter clips where we talk about specific topics. You'll love it. And don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed our content and you want more.